Good morning. My name is Coralis Smith, and on behalf of the Circle of Oak, our pagan group, worship producer Vincent Rains and others on the worship team, welcome to worship service with First Unitarian Church of Oakland here on October 31st. Please turn your camera off while we begin our service and write, light our chalice and candles. This will allow us to begin with a quiet space. We will turn our cameras on to greet each other later in the service. Please note that we are recording the service. So if you don't want to be in the recording, please keep your camera turned off. For best viewing experience, we recommend that you make certain you have the up-to-date version of the Zoom app on your computer. Hello, my name is Reverend Teresa Ninan Soto. I'm the lead minister here at the First Unitarian Church of Oakland. And we're so glad you're here today. We are an intentionally multi-generational, multiracial, multicultural, inclusive and anti-oppressive religious community. You are welcome here. We invite you to fill out the guest connection card you'll see in the chat. We want to be able to support you in our exploration of what's available in our community that interests you and see how you might participate. Welcome. Now, before we begin our worship service, we have just a few reminders. Reopening is getting very near. We are moving toward reopening with a soft launch on November 14th and a celebration and ritual Sunday on November 21st, or I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right, November 21st. So if you'd like to know more about the safety requirements, masks, distancing, and so on, please check your chalice chatter. Second is music for justice. Seven, Sunday, November 14th at 7 p.m. by Zoom. Join the festivities to enjoy Latino music and support Genesis in the connection of our communities for the purpose of a better world. And the Conference of Parties is the decision-making body of the United Nations. And it's the framework convention on climate change. Join the march to add your voice and presence to demands at the conference of that Saturday, November 6th, Bay Area March at Sproul Plaza at UC Berkeley. It's a youth-led march to draw that attention to the conference of party in your chalice chatter. Good morning. As a pagan circle is a earth-based group, we are going to make a land acknowledgement to the land that we are on. I want to acknowledge, acknowledge the colonized lands of the Lisgen and Wawakma Ohlone people on which we live and on which our spiritual home sits at 14th and Castro in what is now known as the city of Oakland. Here's a quote from the official website of Mwakema Ohlone tribe at www.mwakema.org. The Ohlone people are still here, though stripped of land and federal recognition status, having none of the rights and privileges of recognized tribes. They are still renewing their cultures, defending sacred sites and actively working to create a better world for the generations to come." End quote. So let us be grateful to the land, honor those who came before us, and contribute to the healing as gracious, gracious and respectful guests. We now invite people to name the peoples whose lands you are on or who, whose land you grow up on. You can put the names of those people in the chat. And now here is Catherine Winship to light our chalice. We light this chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism. May it remind us of the divine spark of all creation 
the power of love to heal what is broken and to be grateful for life's blessings each day. And now Ash Kelly will light the Black Lives Matter candle. We light this candle in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and work for the day in which Black lives are treated equitably with dignity and justice. Now here is Zia Swim to light our peace candle. Peace comes from being able to contribute the best that we have and all that we are able or all that we are toward creating a world that supports everyone. Hafsat Abiola, Nigerian human rights activist. And now Piper will, cal will cast circle. <laughs> <sighs> in a ritual the pagan ritual we would gather together in some sort of probably circular fashion to recognize the space where we are gathered as sacred we can't make space be sacred because the space already is. Echo, 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 echo. But it's so important to pause and acknowledge the sacredness of this place that is constructed of all of our individual homes and shortly for some of us will be in one place together. And this time of this ritual, this service. So we're going to cast circle today by building our community with our voices in one of our favorite rituals by Zoom or in person, greeting our neighbors. I invite you to unmute and greet one another and together build this sacred space. Hello. Good to see Hello. Hi. Morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Happy Halloween. Happy New Year. Morning, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Hi, I'm Jay from Marcy. Hi, Hi. Hi Ingrid. Hi. I haven't seen Hi, you in a while. Hi, Hester. Hi, Hi Jeffrey. Jimmy. Hi, Carol. Hi, Jane. Hi. 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 Hi, there. Hi, Hi. 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 Evelyn. Hi, hey, Carol. Hi, Mary. Morning. Hi, Hi. Morning. Hi Helen. Hi, Hi there. Hi, Teresa. Yep. Hi, Carlos. Hi, Hi, there. Hi, <laughs> Sally. Hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hi, Ron. All right. Hi, Dick. Haven't seen you in a while. Hi, girls. Hi. Come back together. Remember to put yourself back on mute. And in case uh, it got lost in the shuffle, Awen also waved and said hi to everyone. <laughs> Yeah, just like that. Our circle is cast. This community is gathered. And into this sacred space, Ash Kelly will invite the elements with some help from some others. Yep. When doing a pagan ritual and earth-based practice, it's important to feel a connection to not just us humans going around being human. There's, there's a lot of other, other beings around, you know, trees, bees, fish, things that aren't even what you would call alive. So let's call them. Let's, let's call the elements. 
from the north, we call air. Thanks for letting us breathe. We'll try to keep the bad stuff out of you. Hail and welcome air. From the east, we call earth. We love to feel you under our feet and watch life grow from you. Hail and welcome earth. From the south, we call fire. Our relationship has been somewhat tenuous recently. Just know that we still appreciate the heat and light you give. Hail and welcome, fire. From the west, we call water. We've been seeing a lot more of you lately and we're really glad. Hail and welcome, water. From the center, we call community. <laughs> we open ourselves to connection, not just with one another in this circle, but with all who live, have lived, and will live. <laughs> welcome, center. Hail and welcome, center. Hi, everyone. I'm Heidi. Um, I'm a member of Circle of Oak. And um, I put together a little presentation for you. Um, so as we move forward on, and this is my dog, Stella. I'm sure you'll hear in the background. I apologize. Um, <laughs> as we move forward on this special day, it's important that we reflect on where we came from. Um, so if you'll indulge me and come along with me on a brief history of this magical holiday that has ancient roots. Samhain has been celebrated by the Celtic people for thousands of years. Um, it was considered the most important of the four fire festivals, um, what we now call the cross quarter holidays. These festivals fall roughly in the midpoint of each of the four seasons. The celebration um, always began with the gathering of the last of the harvest. People would put off their hearths and um, leave their hearths going while they went out in the fields and gathered the rest of the food, storing it for winter. Um, a great community fire would burn as community members welcomed the darkness of winter and honor their ancestors. Cattle who were least likely to survive the harsh winter were slaughtered, their meat stored. While we no longer slaughter cows during Samhain, or at least I don't, uh, this idea of releasing what no longer serves us um, is still a very common way to celebrate Samhain. Um, it's sometimes done by people writing down what you want to release on a piece of paper and then setting it ablaze. As Christianity moved into the region during the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church tried to transform Samhain, along with other pagan traditions, um, into a Christian celebration. In the 5th century, Pope Boniface moved the celebration to May 13th and specified it as a day celebrating saints and martyrs. Um, however, his plan failed and the fall fire festivals continued. Um, then in the ninth century, Pope Gregory moved the celebration back to the, the fall festival times, but declared it All Saints Day followed immediately by All Souls Day. The Irish potato famine in the mid 19th century caused a wave of immigration from Ireland to the United States. The Irish immigrants brought their Halloween traditions with them and the holiday quickly gained popularity in America. Uh, fun fact, pumpkins native to um, America replaced turnips as the produce of choice for creating jack-o'-lanterns. In modern Wicca, Samhain is the last of the three harvest festivals in the wheel of the year, and it's recognized as the witch's new year. Samhain is recognized as a new year in Wicca because it marks the end of the harvest season and the dawn of the darkest quarter of the year. Wiccan theology also recognizes Samhain 
as the time when the god, represented by the sun, dies, going off to recharge before being reborn to the goddess at Yule in December. One way people have been celebrating Samhain for centuries is by hosting a silent supper. A place would be set at the table for each ancestor you are honoring. Um, guests eat in complete silence. Um, to, they eat in complete silence and they may even write letters to their beloved dead um, to be burned in the hearth at the close of the supper. So for centuries, Samhain has been a time to honor our beloved dead. This is also reflected with the Catholic All Souls Day and Dia de los Muertos, making this holiday and this season one that transcends religious religions and cultures and brings us all together in respect of our loved ones. A poem by... Melani Jalaluddin Rumi, when I die. When I die, when my coffin is being taken out, you must never think I, I am missing this world. Don't shed any tears. Don't lament or feel sorry. I'm not falling into a monster's abyss. When you see my corpse is being carried, don't cry for my leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm arriving at eternal love. When you leave me in the grave, don't say goodbye. Remember a grave is only a curtain for the paradise behind. You'll only see me descending into a grave. Now watch me rise. How can there be an end when the sun sets or the moon goes down? It looks like the end, it seems like a sunset, but in reality, it is a dawn. When the grave locks you up, that is when your soul is freed. Have you ever seen a seed fallen to earth not rise with new life? Why should you doubt the rise of a seed named human? Have you ever seen a bucket lowered into the well coming back empty? Why lament for a soul when it, can, when it comes back like Joseph from the well? When for the last time you close your mouth, your words and soul will belong to the world of no place, no time. And now I invite you to stay on mute and sing with us and join Susan Keiter and Renee Witten in hymn number 389, Gathered Here. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near, gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here struggle and the power spirit draw near gathered here in the mystery of the hour gathered here in one strong body gathered here in the struggle and the power spirit draw Good morning, church, and happy Samhain, and happy Halloween. As you've probably heard by now, this is a really special time of year for us witches and pagans. 
It's a time when the veil between the worlds is thinnest and we are reminded that death is but a part of life, an ending which in turn becomes the beginning. It's also the time when our ancestors come to dine and dance with us. It's a time of reunions, albeit sometimes bittersweet ones. My mother loved Halloween. Scary movies, costumes, pumpkin carving, spending hours decorating her porch with ghouls and goblins and webs and flying light up bats that would whiz past her head at just the right moment. She loved it all. She'd host Halloween parties and invite all her neighbors over on Halloween night to hang out in costume and pass out candy. We lived on a very steep hill and consequently would maybe see five kids the entire evening, but that never deterred her. She always had a bucket full of candy just waiting, just in case. As adults, our October 31st did look very different, but they were of equal importance. In the before times, before COVID, confined us to our computer screens, I used to host a silent supper every October 31st at my home for pagan and non-pagan friends alike. We'd bring favorite foods our ancestors enjoyed, always Twizzlers and apples for my dad, and then after our silent communal meal, we'd go around the table and share stories, songs, sayings, memories, art, photos of ancestors, whether they're of blood or of spirit, and mix tears with laughter as the hours flew by. These annual gatherings would remind me of my family Sunday dinners at my grandparents' house as a child. At those dinners, my uncle Ched would prepare magnificent feasts as he peppered conversation with corny jokes. My grandmother decked out in her Sunday best, raising an eyebrow as my grandfather burst into songs from his Air Force days that oddly resembled sea shanties. My parents clapping politely as my sister and me performed the latest dance or poem we learned that week in school or Girl Scouts, laughing, singing, occasionally yelling but always vibrant and always very much alive. Those sounds have since gone quiet, replaced by the noise of somber chewing and utensils hitting plates. But once the Samhain meal is finished and the silence broken, I might share a story about my uncle's terribly wonderful cooking and wonderfully terrible puns. My father's uncanny gift of always knowing exactly what shade of paint a customer would want right before they walked in the door of his store. That photo of my grandfather and toddler me fishing, standing side by side at a pier at the Jersey Shore. And before I know it, there they are, sitting around the table together again. How do we call our ancestors? How do we connect with our loved ones when we can no longer hold their hand? Before my cousin Richard passed away, he called me, seemingly out of the blue one day, frantically looking for a hand-carved violin his father had made. Although the violin had been given to my younger sister over 25 years ago, it was the only tangible link he had to his late father and its presence was suddenly essential. When my sister successfully located and returned the violin, Richard was so relieved and grateful, he invited us to his home. A week before our planned visit, Richard passed away. I like to think he needed his father by his side to help him on his journey and knew that the violin was that connection. I know that his father played him a song of welcome on that handmade violin and I know it was beautiful. Our ancestors are with us for all of our joys, our sorrows, our arrivals, and yes, even our partings. And this Samhain, our Sunday family dinners, what helps you feel connected to your loved ones, your beloved dead? Is it a precious object like the violin? A piece of jewelry, a toy gifted in infancy, a photograph? Is it a song or a lullaby, 
a joke, a smell, a place, a favorite meal. Or maybe it's a gift or a talent passed on from a parent or caretaker, or a skill taught by a beloved teacher or mentor. It's my signature, which is almost indecipherable from my mom's. It's my uncle's strawberry pie recipe. It's this puppet that my dad gave me as a baby to comfort me and help me go to sleep. It's my coworker Shakur's words of encouragement and commitment to treating any, anyone in need with unconditional positive regard. Or maybe it's sitting on your porch with a bucket of treats, marking the season with a sense of wonder and hope for the new year to come. It's sharing a tiny piece of my family with you today. This Samhain, I invite you to try new ways to connect with your own beloved dead. Whether that link is a silent supper or just a glance in the mirror, share their memory with the living and know that when you need them, they're just a song, a story, a puppet away. May we all find comfort in tonight's visitations and remember we are never alone for she who is remembered lives. Blessed Samhain. Let's do a little magic now, shall we? And here's a secret, magic is imagination. When we seek to become stronger as witches, we cultivate our imaginations. We imagine, set intentions, and use ritual to manifest what we seek into this world. For the next few minutes, I invite you into this playful and powerful witchy work. We'll take a deep breath together and on the exhale, set down your agendas and worries and skepticisms. Let's imagine possibility together. Today, the veil between the worlds is at its thinnest. What barrier separates us from our beloved dead, if there ever is one, is now paper thin. We can reach out and touch those beloved so easily. Catherine reminded us of some tools that we may use. But first, we think about who exactly we're trying to connect with. When I say beloved dead, I don't mean just any ancestor of blood or of tradition. There are a lot of unhealthy ancestors out there or people you just don't want to connect with right now. That's fine. We set our intentions carefully. Which whole and healthy ancestor do you want to contact? Maybe the name leaps to mind. Maybe you don't know any of your ancestors, but want to meet one. Maybe you need a moment to think it through. Let's take that moment now. And so with that beloved, healthy ancestor in mind, even if you don't know their name, we begin in your mind or with your body reach out just as if you were drawing aside a curtain or opening a door make sure there's a space near you where you can picture your beloved ancestor coming to sit imagine them entering and sitting down. What details do you notice? A smile? A familiar object? A smell that calls to memory? Perhaps you hear words of greeting or feel a desired warm embrace. 
Jesus. Make sure your guest is comfortable. Let them know you're so glad they're here and that it's almost time to eat together. For five minutes, we will feast with these beloved dead. You might find some physical food to eat or imagine sharing food with them. You might think back on stories you know of them or moments you shared together. You might write them a letter. If you listen closely, I think you'll hear some message from them. Even if tomorrow you prefer to think of it as a message from your own unconscious mind, for now, imagine that it's perfectly possible that this message comes directly from your beloved dead. During this time, we will hold silence together. On your screen, you will see pictures of beloved ancestors of our community. When the time has ended, I will invite you to name your beloved dead as part of our embracing meditation. But for now, take these five short minutes just to be in their company. Let us begin.
So who are you feasting with? Who are you thinking of and remembering in this time? I invite you to unmute and speak the names of our beloved dead, that we can embrace them together. Voices, overlapping voices, you don't need to wait for your turn. And if you have pictures to show, please to. My father, Nathan Weisberg. Howard Hubbard. <laughs> Cora Farley. My parent, Joe and Esther. Carol Graywing. Oh, yeah. Isola. Joe Boytek. Adele Schattenfeld. Emma Foss. My mother, Joan Ellison, and stepmother, Marcy Rubel. Judy Free Spirit. My uh, mother, Harriet Smith, and her sisters. Park Webster Smith, father. Sheridan, mother. My father. I Died. My grandmother, Ruth Liebman. Bertha Louise Dickerson and Nancy Real the George. My father, Stephen Moreland. My brother, John yeah. Henry Green. My friend, Suzette Estrada. My friend, David uh, Thorpe. Thorpe. Yeah, David Thorpe. My mother and her brothers and sisters and parents. My parents in my previous generation. My parents, Sally Sweetlove Hodgkins Brandt and my stepdad, Lester Melvin Brandt, Roxy's parents, Barbara Baxter, and Pete St. Clair Kellum. My parents, Bud and Mary Duffy. <sighs> My stepsister, Mary Balejos. In these names and so many others, the community of our beloved dead is larger than the community of we who live and honor them. They surround us and enfold us as we reach out to embrace them. We hold them in our memory and in our care. This is a time of so many feelings. Let us enter together to a time of prayer and reflection, of noticing You may be experiencing intense grief, a gentle sadness, maybe candy-fueled excitement for this evening. The depression of such a long separation from one another. Soon many of us will gather together again in person and some of us won't be there. And some of us won't be there ever again. Myself, as I think about reopening, I think about the baby a few weeks older than Awen, Meredith, who passed away, who was a member of our community. There are so many that we hold in our hearts. Our hearts are so full, so many different feelings. Samhain is a time 
to honor those feelings, those people can be difficult to remember in the rushed flow of every day. So we take a breath together and let it out. You feel deeply. We remember. In our tradition, Zia's and mine, within the pagan umbrella, which is reclaiming witchcraft, there is a phrase that we say at this time of year as we remember the ancestors. What is remembered lives. I invite you to repeat it with us. What, what is, is remembered is remembered. Lives. Lives. What is remembered lives and thrice makes a spell. What is remembered lives. For connection, for grief, for growth, for joy incoming. And love. Blessed Samhain. Now, Samhain is also a time to remember this time of greatest darkness is not a time for fear. We have an association between darkness and evil or fear or bad things that is one aspect of our common cultural theology that can reinforce white supremacy and violence against people of color. And so in any Samhain service, we find a moment to honor the sacred darkness. In this service, we do it with a time of music, with hymn number 50, When Darkness Nears. You're welcome to sing along if you like. When darkness nears and embers die, the wind in trees a distant sigh, the end of days like a love. When night draws close, a fond embrace, the heart then slows its frantic pace, and fear drifts on as a cold breath takes its place. The cradle of a velvet wing, it holds us in. slips in with the songs our dreams Hi everybody, um, I'm scheduled to do a crone report here, um, which may be, as the French say, de trop, because I feel so complete already with this service, but I'll offer it anyway. I'd like you to consider elderhood. I've been wondering about it. What is an elder? Do you automatically become one if you arrive at a ripe old age? What is the value of an elder? The conventional answer to that last question is that elders are valuable because they have wisdom. I think that doesn't mean that someone is wise because they are old, but that their odds of acquiring wisdom have increased through greater experience. We could say there's a higher percentage of wisdom in the eldest than there is in the general population because the oldest people have had many learning experiences 
and what they have learned lives with them. Certainly elderhood involves having passed through a lot of experiences from which wisdom might be derived, but it is an automatic. We know old people who haven't learned enough. In this very profound book, Come of Age, The Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble, Stephen Jenkinson writes, Elders are the visitation of time upon the people. By virtue of their willingness to forego both the follies and the capacities of their younger days and to be summoned to the feast hall of all days and to answer the summons pilgrim style, seeking the generous host who has included them on the guest list, by practicing with the limits of dexterity and endurance, the courtesies age would recognize them by, elders are the mystery days of younger people. Elders are those who show us it's possible to age, optimally that old age is a natural part of life. We're all only too aware of the enormous effort our culture makes to prevent and deny aging. Women especially are targets of messages about how only youthful looks can preserve or create relevancy in our society. Be sexy or disappear. Having wrinkles, the signs of aging experience, is especially to be shunned. We spend umpteen billions on products to preserve a youthful look or on ghastly surgeries to reverse aging. All this is overwhelmingly oppressive, futile, and very sad. We are denying our own experience that which can lead to wisdom. Maybe the reason, one reason, so many contemporary people try to avoid aging or looking aged, always trying to look younger, is that there are so few elders around. They're largely cut off from seeing elders. This is one of the effects of the breakup of the extended family. It's truly a cause for sorrow for both the elders and the young. How can the elders share their experience and endurance if the young are not around? And how can the young be held in and understand the spiral of time if there are few elders among them? Of course, one fears aging if the prospect is only to be sequestered, even warehoused, in elder ghettos, as my father was for seven years. I just referred to the spiral of time a way of thinking about time which suggests that our lives, in our lives, we come around again and again to the same issues and points of learning. Think about how in your early life, you told yourself that you would never do something your parents did. Then you find yourself saying and doing things distinctly recall, that you distinctly recall forbidding yourself from doing years before. According to Stephen Jenkinson, the concept of spiraling time credits these recurrences as your right and proper inheritance, partly personal and partly ancestral, credits the passage of time as the medium of wisdom. It is not inevitably a wisdom bringer, but it brings the currency of wisdom in its looping current. Extended time brings the possibility that the past is not gone from us nor are we bound to repeat it. The real possibility that experience plus understanding of time can bring us wisdom that underlines elderhood. In The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle stresses that there is no past or future. The places our minds take us so often when in fact, there is only now. And he, like Ram Dass in an earlier generation, counsels us to be here now, or as Jesus told us, to be like the lilies of the field, not seeking anything, simply being in the splendid moment of now. This doesn't mean that we can't take account of the past or the future or different places in time that influence the present, the now, or that we can't act to change things in the present so as to influence the future. However, perhaps we can't truly honor the now without observing the now in people of different ages. An elder is a gift for this purpose. Let me digress or seem to digress for a moment. The Hindu religion prescribes a life path that is an upward path 
in contrast to a life curbed like a bridge, as in the West, which builds, uh, pardon me, builds to fulfillment at the top of the curve and then declines. The Hindu tradition describes a life structure consisting of four stages through which each person passes. In the first stage, one is a student getting ready for the later stages of life. The second is the householder stage, creating a family, producing and distributing wealth and experiencing pleasure. In the third stage, after fulfilling their obligations to their family, a person starts to detach from family life and the pursuit of material ends, devoting time to spiritual practice, seeking solace, knowledge, peace, and freedom. The fourth stage is renunciation, in which people simplify life, subsisting on a minimum of possessions and devoting themselves to nonviolence to attain liberation from the cycle of birth and rebirth. Interestingly, one source told me that that fourth stage renunciation is no longer emphasized. I find this schema interesting in that it envisions a path towards spiritual awareness, a culmination of life that isn't sad or to be feared. Of course, I don't know how many Hindus actually follow this uh, schema of stages, but the pattern is significantly different than the way we envision elderhood or in the West, we envisioned it, that offered by Western capitalist society, a materially abundant world so often spiritually deprived in regards to aging. I'm trying to think of my own aging in this way. As an elder, one has accumulated a certain amount of, of what I'll call juju for lack of my own term. And this juju could be called an intuitive power too. This power, this juju can be communicated to others. I'll conclude with another passage from Stephen Jenkinson that I found very useful and inspiring in this regard. Elderhood is learning the work of blessing and with greater and greater courtesy, seeking it and by asking for its bestowal and by bestowing it thereby. Crafty bastards, elders, and all along not letting on, all along not knowing they are, they confer blessing by raising and praising the worthiness of those they seek it from. The alchemy of blessing is known to elders. They know its power to subvert unworthiness and confer merit and to raise up, raise up enough so that the waning is clear so that when the time comes, there is a hilltop of earned merit from which to descend. When an elder is buried, they're wrapped in the cloaks of their various offices adorned with the worn names by which they were known in their lives. By the time their people are done with them and they go to the ground, elders have disappeared into the layers of what their lives have meant, all memory remembered. Thank you, Corliss. We've now come to that point in our um, service where we open our hearts and our pocketbooks. Uh, to give back to this beautiful community that we have. Um, I know that I always leave these meetings um, feeling extremely full of gratitude. Um, and as we continue along our way, as, I, as the Buddha said, a generous heart, kind speech, and a life of service and compassion are things which renew humanity. So we ask you to give if you can, if you don't have the means, we ask that you continue to bring your generous, kind spirit to share with us all. And now we'll give you about 90 seconds to make the donation of your choice while the music plays. Information on how to do that is in the chat and will be on the screen.
please remain on mute and join me in saying our words of congressional congregational commitment to the work of the church which is weaving a tapestry of love we call community we dedicate ourselves and these are offerings The service was a little bit much for all that it seems. So while they sleep, let us say farewell to the ancestors with a song that is sacred to several of us, that is a feature of the large pagan ritual called Spiral Dance, which this year happened yesterday afternoon is called When We Are Gone. And if you know it, or you would like to pick it up as we go, please just make sure to remain on mute as you add your voices. When we are gone, they will beloved dead who are lingering near you need perhaps one more farewell to be on their way you can tell them a gentle thank you they'll see you again when the veil is thin next year at Samhain Now it will be time to release the elements. And as we ended by inviting in center and community, so we begin to say hail and thank you with community. Center community, we look forward to seeing you again soon and especially on November 14th and 21st. Oh, hail and farewell, community. Hail and farewell, community. West, water, 
Keep on flowing and tell the moon we said hi. Hail and farewell, water. South, fire. Thanks for keeping us warm and keeping the electrons and electrioles in our heads bouncing around. Hail and farewell, fire. East, earth, you are always here and we promise not to take you for granted. Hail and farewell, earth. North, air, return to the sky and be free. Hail and farewell, air. Samhain is a time when the veil between the worlds is thin. It is a time that is sacred to so many people around the world and across time. It is a time of magic, connection, and transformation. What do you want to carry forward with you from all of the thoughts, wisdom, experiences, and magic of this past little time? I invite you to name it either silently or aloud to yourself so that you don't forget. Thank you, beloved ancestors. Thank you, beloved community. Be well and see you soon. Blessed be.